Hotel. We're on a conference call uh, with a number of people uh, from the FDA. And what had preceded that during the day, uh, since of our press conference yesterday afternoon, was a lot of calls back and forth between the FDA and Battelle. Uh, they compressed uh, what normally would take a matter of days going back and forth with questions and answers. Uh, they managed to compress that into a few hours, and I'm very grateful for everyone who was able to do that uh, because uh, late last night we got very good news, and that is that uh, the FDA had approved Battelle uh, to move forward at full capacity uh, in regard to uh, being able to take the masks that are so very, very important uh, to our first responders and to our doctors and our nurses and everyone in healthcare, and to be able to uh, sterilize these at uh, a very, very high rate every single day. And so we are very happy about that. We know that today they are moving forward, um, and within a few days we'll be up to full, full capacity. This is a major breakthrough for us in Ohio, but it's also uh, something where we're taking Ohio technology and helping other states. So we're very proud of that. Uh, we know Battelle already has one of the machines in New York. Uh, I had the opportunity to talk to Governor Cuomo late yesterday afternoon, and uh, we know the other machine is on its way. Uh, this will also uh, help Seattle. Uh, we believe also the Washington, D.C. area, and Battelle will continue uh, in, the, in the weeks ahead to get more of these uh, machines out to different parts of the country. So a, a great victory yesterday, and we're very, very happy about that. Just as we have throughout this crisis relied on good medical counsel for us, good science counsel, we put working group together of, of doctors to give us advice. Uh, Lieutenant Governor and I think that it's also very important as we look to the future and uh, look to when we're gonna come out of this and how we come out of this, uh, that we have a group of businessmen and women uh, who reflect Ohio, who, who are Ohio, look like Ohio, small businesses, midsize, larger businesses, to give us advice um, in regard to how we best do that. Uh, so this group uh, will, in the next several days, will actually officially name that and we'll come back and talk about that. Uh, but I want to give you a little preview. We'll be, we will be doing that. It's a work in progress. We're almost done assembling the group. And they will be on the phone uh, every day or so uh, giving us advice and counsel, uh, also looking at issues such as how business can better uh, follow the guidelines and, and enforce the social distances, those businesses that are still uh, operating. Uh, they'll give us counsel in regard to that, but also counsel as we go forward because we know that um, there are so many people who are unemployed. Uh, we know there's so many men and women who have a business, small business, uh, and they're very, very concerned about it, whether they'll ever be able to open again. Uh, these are all things that are very, very important. And so having good counsel uh, as we move forward, just as we relied on good counsel to make the decisions uh, in regard to uh, protecting us, uh, the medical decisions, uh, we need help as well and counsel and advice with the business decisions. Uh, let me uh, bring up another uh, Topic. I had the opportunity to talk with uh, our mayors about this a little bit, uh, but that is our efforts to reach out to uh, non-English speakers in Ohio or people whose first language is not English. And let me tell you where we are in regard to that. It is a work in progress. We intend to continue to do more because it's important that every Ohioan uh, get all the information uh, that we have in regard to the coronavirus. And as the health department shares information, as I share information that Lieutenant Governor does, we want to make sure that everyone is, is getting that. Uh, so, so currently, when you go to coronavirus at cor coronavirus.ohio.gov, which is the place where you look, this is up in Spanish, uh, Chinese, and in Somalia. Um, that is the top tips, basically the, the, the 
the executive summary part of that. Uh, chemical abstract here in Ohio is working uh, and is doing this for free, and we are very, very grateful for them. They are also translating uh, everything, uh, longer version, into Spanish, Chinese, Somalia, but also in, into Arabic. So that will be coming online uh, shortly. Let me also give a shout out to the Ohio Channel. Uh, you can go up on ohiochannel.org uh, and see these press conferences. Um, but the point is not that you have to go watch them again or you want to watch them again, but uh, you can go after it's they're uploaded and you can pick your language uh, and you get closed captioning in that language. So that might be, again, something that people can utilize. Um, let me also give a shout out to the Ohio Commission on Hispanic and Latino Affairs. They've been our partners throughout this and they are doing a, a very, very good job as well. Uh, let me move to another uh, topic, uh, to all the hospitals out there. Uh, we really have a request, and it's a request that I think uh, is clearly the right thing to do. It's going to get you better results, or at least quicker results. Uh, and that is, please send your samples when someone is tested. Please send them either to a, a neighboring hospital uh, that does quick testing, uh, and they can get the results back to you quickly, or send it to the Ohio Department of Health. Uh, I don't think it's acceptable as we go through this crisis to be in a situation where we are waiting and people are waiting uh, four, five, and six days. Uh, unfortunately, that is what we are seeing from the outside labs uh, that some of you have contracts with. Uh, so again, the Ohio Department of Health will do this for free. Uh, it's in the best interest of your patients, the best interest of, of you to get that to us. Uh, we will get that turned around in less than 24 hours, sometimes it's eight to 10 hours, and get you back the results. Um, this is something that you know, I, I think is, is very, very important. And again, there's nothing wrong with the private labs, they do good work. We are not. Uh, we can get these results back to you very, very quickly. Please, please uh, you, use us to do that. Um, Dr. Acton uh, will, in, in, a, in a moment, uh, along with General Harris, uh, give you all an update in regard to our hospital build out uh, and what our plans are, how that progress is moving forward. And again, this is something that is so very, very important. We got two variables. One is all of us slowing this coronavirus down by distancing from others. The other is it's a race for time as we build out the hospital capacity. Uh, and it's not just, of course, the hospital capacity. It's also buying us time, not just to build out the hospital capacity and get ready for that, but also allowing more technology to come online that helps us in so many ways. For example, what Battelle did and the, what we are getting this week now for the first time. So all of this technology that's coming online, every day uh, that we can delay the real onslaught of this uh, tidal wave that's coming to Ohio is a day that we can see the technology move forward and we can get better, better ready for that. So in a moment, um, Dr. Acton, General Harris will give you uh, that update. Uh, we historically don't really have a hospital system in the state. We have hospital systems. Uh, what we're doing, and I want to thank the hospitals, they have really, really come through. Uh, they're working together. Uh, they're talking to each other. Uh, they're helping us plan. Uh, so I just want to give a shout out to our hospitals. Thank you. You're doing a great job uh, as we go through this and go into our eight regions and put a plan together and then execute on that plan. Uh, in the eight regions. Again, our goal every single day is to protect Ohioans. And for any Ohioan who comes down with the virus, we want them to be able to plug directly in and their health care provider uh, to a process that will work very, very well. And that is coming along uh, as we move forward. Uh, let me talk about our, our K through 12 schools. Um, we originally rolled out um, an order uh, that separated our students from the physical classrooms um, for three weeks. 
Uh, we're today uh, giving an additional order uh, that Dr. Acton will sign that will, that will take this um, to <clears throat> May 1st, which happens to be a Friday. Uh, we'll reevaluate this as we get closer to May 1st. Uh, so this should not be a surprise to anyone, but uh, I, I wanted to clarify that today, uh, get that out so everybody knows how to plan. I want to thank um, the teachers, administrators. Uh, you were doing a phenomenal job under very difficult circumstances. I want to thank the parents. I want to thank the students. Uh, this is uh, a problem not of our making, uh, but it's a problem that you all have stepped up to and are doing a, a great job. And so thank you very, very much for that, that great, great work. Let me now uh, talk a little bit about another effort that's going on uh, to get us ready. And that is some work that's being done in Ohio prisons. Uh, our Ohio prisons are working hard to make additional uh, PPE, uh, personal protection equipment. Uh, so far, they have made 500 hospital gowns. Uh, they will be able to make 44,000 as soon as they get the additional fabric, which we hope is coming soon. Uh, they will be able to start making uh, masks, uh, similar to surgical masks. Uh, these would be the lower tech mask soon and will be able to make 5,000 a day up to a total of 2 million. So these will be very helpful. They're now awaiting the delivery of ingredients uh, that they expect to get here around April 14th, and then should be able to make uh, 1,400 gallons of hand sanitizer. So these are all things uh, that they're working on. Uh, they're also gearing up to make uh, face shields. They're currently sourcing out the materials and making patterns. And further, each prison has its own workshop and will make masks for the people in those prisons. So again, everyone is, is coming on board, and I want to thank the director uh, for that and, and the, all our folks that work in our prisons, and we thank the prisoners for working on that. Uh, again, very, very important. Uh, one of the issues that uh, we have been working on and working with our mayors and working with our, our communities and our local health departments has to do with the homeless, and so I want to give a little uh, report on that now. Um, you know, every day we talk about the importance of social distancing. Uh, we talk about staying home, but there are people who may rely on homeless shelters or domestic shelters, and that is, the, is where they go. Uh, there are also people with developmental disabilities or severe and persistent mental illness who live in group homes. There are people living in recovery houses as well. Um, as part of a strike force that we put together, we've created a homeless uh, team dedicated to this specific work each day. For example, the CDC issued guidelines about homeless shelters and domestic violence shelters. While these documents are available to communities in Ohio now, our state homeless team is customizing those for Ohio's local use. We are grateful for groups such as the Coalition on Housing and Homelessness in Ohio, the Ohio chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and the Ohio Recovery Housing, who are all helping us work through what's needed on the front lines. A big challenge is still helping reduce the number of people in our homeless shelters. Uh, shelters are not built, as you can imagine, for social distancing, and they present unique problems and challenges. Uh, many communities are, in fact, finding alternatives to shelter or spreading out to other locations. We are asking all of our communities to include homeless shelters in your planning so that we can move, more quickly help support these Ohioans to meet the social distancing guidelines. The CDC guidelines and information about all these funding opportunities are on the coronas.ohio.gov website. The site will continue to be updated as this work progresses this week and into the future. Also, the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services has created an email address, and that is, and I'll read it, COVID-19 housing at ohio.mha.gov. I'll read it again. That's COVID-19 housing at ohio.mha.gov. If you or your organization have questions or concerns, uh, that's a place to look. Let me again say that that is 
the right address, COVID-19, housing at ohio.mha.gov. Uh, we've talked, uh, Dr. Acton and I talked on the phone uh, and Lieutenant Governor to the mayors of our major cities today as we do every day and exchanged, I think, some very good ideas in regard to homeless people and how we can best serve them and serve the community. So again, this is, this is part of our efforts uh, to continue to focus on uh, social distancing. Uh, let me now uh, turn to uh, General Harris, who I believe is gonna come up there in a moment. We'll get General Harris up and ask him to give us a little report and we'll follow that um, with the Lieutenant Governor and uh, then Dr. Acton. General, good to see you. Thank you, Governor. Thank you very much. Give us I'm a little here today. report. I'm working in the Emergency Operations Center in Columbus. This Emergency Operations Center is the nerve center for this whole of government response to the COVID crisis. And I have to give a shout out to the quiet professionals who are working here and tirelessly coordinating and synchronizing this whole of government approach. We're so deeply grateful for everything that they're doing here. The main effort that's happening here is the obvious preparation for the, for the medical capacity surge that we know that we're going to need as this COVID spread peaks. Now, when I talk about building out capacity, we really look at that in a number of lines of effort. Uh, for example, uh, we look at leasing or acquiring facilities as necessary, or even looking across the spectrum of unused state facilities that we can bring to bear for this problem. Uh, it may include building out facilities uh, in partnership with the regions that I'll talk about in a second. Uh, it may include surging equipment, pushing that equipment forward where it's most needed, uh, surging personnel, helping with staffing, because we know that the workforce is going to be stressed during these peak periods. And, and obviously, uh, as everyone knows, uh, we're looking to surge PPE because that is a such a such in-demand item right now. now. Now, Governor DeWine has directed that we use every approach possible, and I will tell you, we are turning over every rock possible. We are innovating as much as possible to engage, to include and engage in the public sector, the private sector, every resource possible to bring every resource that we can find to bear on this problem. The best thing happening here in Ohio, as the governor said, is this collaboration that's happening out in the regions. The, these healthcare providers are doing a fantastic job of, of coordinating and, and planning their strategy for patient care so that they can maximize the resources. And what that does is creates the opportunity for us to better target the resources that we bring to bear not only for maximum efficiency, but making sure that we've got the right stuff in the right place at the right time for when it's needed during this period. So this allows us to optimize. Now I promise that, that when the National Guard had a new mission or we were gonna be in your communities, that I would tell you. So I'm telling you, uh, you're gonna see service members in uniform in your community doing things in, in increasing numbers here in the very new, near future. Now, now, they'll be uh, conducting a site, a site assessments, but the most important thing they're gonna be doing is, is liaisoning with these regional leaders to make sure that we know what the requirements are and we're bringing the right requirements to the right place in partnership with the Ohio Department of Health and with those regional leaders. So I need to emphasize one last time that every person is a participant in this, your actions, your individual actions are critical to ensuring that we continue to flatten the curve. We've had tremendous success with that so far, but we need tactical patience now, and we need to continue this fight because the actions that we take now will determine how tough that fight is for our frontline personnel, those medical providers, those practitioners that are going to be on the front line during this fight. Our actions now will determine how hard their life is during this peak. So thank you for your continued contribution. Thanks for your patience. And most importantly, looking forward to, to how this turns out because I know we'll all be better for it when we come out on the other end. Thanks, General. Appreciate it very much. Lieutenant Governor. Uh, thank you very much, Governor uh, and General Harris. And uh, I'm gonna try to get through my part quickly so we can get on to Dr. Acton. But 
uh, you know, the governor and I get a lot of calls for, and, and contact from people all around the state. And one of the things that has been emerging is concern over the commercial lending market. And you may think this is just about business, but it's not just about business. If you will recall, after the, the financial crisis of 2018, we had a lot of um, uh, businesses that uh, weren't able to pay their mortgages. So we had a lot of businesses that were vacant, empty, spread throughout our state. Uh, and that's not a site we wanna see in our communities. To the Ohio banks and credit unions, most all of them have embraced the, their responsibility in this. Uh, what they have done is they've uh, deferred loan uh, interest and principal payments to the back end of the loan, taking 90 days uh, to give uh, businesses a chance to have the cash to get through this situation, and then, uh, and then uh, we'll recover it on the back end of those loans. But uh, of that marketplace in Ohio, Ohio regulated institutions are only about $15 billion of that market. Uh, outside of Ohio regulated entities are $240 billion of that market. So we only have a limited control from our institutions in Ohio. What we need the, these other institutions to do is to work with businesses on this issue. Um, give me an example how this, this trickles up the, the, the supply chain, uh, the, the daisy chain, so to speak. We, we don't want, uh, say for example, somebody who has an apartment to, to uh, evict somebody for 90 days. And we've said that and we're working with the court system to make sure that that doesn't happen. But if you own an apartment complex that say had 32 apartments and eight people couldn't pay, well the person that owns that apartment complex will not be able to pay their mortgage and could be foreclosed upon. You see, this is how this all fits together. We say that we're in this together. It's not only in the health standpoint, it's, in the econ it's from the economic point of view as well. And so uh, we're asking um, these uh, particular commercial mortgage uh, bank uh, back securities to work with local businesses on this, but uh, we are working with the business community. One message that we want to have and lenders that we need to come up with a state solution. We talked with our congressional delegation about a federal solution today. J just know that this conversation is ongoing and that all of you who've called in and asked us to look at this issue, uh, we're, we're preparing uh, some action on that. Uh, I also would like to add uh, that reminder, voting, April 28th, you can, you can get your absentee ballot request at votoohio.gov, or you can call your local board of elections and request that ballot. Please don't wait. Uh, I was told, uh, I know I've talked to Secretary LaRose about this, I've talked to local boards of elections. Every time we announce this, people get, get reminded to do that. So call, get your absentee ballot so that you can participate uh, in the election that's coming up uh, for uh, final vote count on April the 28th. I uh, do want to echo Governor DeWine's um, thank to the FDA uh, over the past week. I think I talked to the FDA probably as much as I've talked to anybody in the, in, in the state or federal government, and, and that quick turnaround yesterday really helped us uh, put Battelle in a position to help those, those frontline healthcare workers get the supplies that they need to keep themselves safe. And uh, uh, tacking on to the announcement that the governor made about the uh, continuation of, of education from home, uh, as the reporters out there are writing their stories, remember that our public television stations in this state uh, have content that, are, that they are producing both for viewers uh, throughout the day with students and also online at uh, PBS Learning Media. So please include that in your story so that the folks out there who are trying to continue the education of their children from home have access to that so that they can enrich the lives of their children and, and ultimately strengthen our education system in the state. Uh, and so with that, I will turn it back over to the governor. Thank you, Governor. Dr. Acton. Okay. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you again. Um, as the governor mentioned yesterday, um, I was not with at the, press, the unexpected press briefing. I was actually out with General Harris um, at the Emergency Operating Center, where we've been doing a lot of work, as he said. It's such a joy to work with him um, and all, all of the members of the National Guard as we sort of strategize how best to deploy the resources we have. 
And in that work, we're working tirelessly with hospitals, with civic leaders, with members of the community, with nonprofits, with philanthropy. So it really is this very integrated, complex effort, an effort that really has never been done in this country. So um, when I say things like inventing or innovating, it really is. And it's, it's up to us in Ohio to find our best strategy. And I have to say, it's been an honor working alongside of them. So I'm gonna start out with a little bit of numbers just to catch everybody up, um, if we could. So again, our dashboard, which is on the coronavirus.ohio.gov, as well as a lot of the other um, addresses and websites you hear about, we always try to put them all in one place for you at coronavirus.ohio.gov, is our dashboard. And we are now at over um, 1,900 cases. Um, and, and uh, many hospitalizations, 475. Be remember that we are testing right now with our limited testing. We're testing the sickest and our healthcare workers and highest at risk. So of course those are gonna be folks who are more likely to be in need of hospitalization and we're seeing that in our numbers. 25% of our cases have actually been hospitalized and about 8% right now are requiring ICU higher level treatment like intubation and ventilators. Um, I'm very sad to say that we now have 39 deaths in Ohio. Um, those have ranged, right now the deaths um, span 19 counties. So um, that is information I've just received. Um, we do have cases in over 70 counties at this point. Uh, we have 88 counties in Ohio. Um, let's go ahead and look at our next slide. Um, also, at this point, we know that we've tested about 27,000 people in Ohio. Um, that's still just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we are maximizing our testing, as the governor said. Make sure if you're a hospital and you're testing someone, if you want it turned around quickly, you can get it. We have a couple hospitals. You know who they are in your region who can do the testing uh, in-house. Or you can also send it to my lab Ohio Department of Health. Um, it's on our website. We can get that run for you in eight hours. It takes us about to run a test. Um, and that time is getting shorter all the time. So it's really important. We don't want to wait that five to six days. Uh, next slide. Uh, again, this is just showing um, that a huge percentage of our cases in Ohio are requiring hospitalization. This is our curve again. Uh, we've talked a lot in the past. Last time I was here, we talked about the hurricane analogy for our modeling. Um, our, you know, our forecast, our weather station gets a little better each time. The more we feed data into this model, the more accurate it gets. And so we're feeling um, that, that they're getting some pretty good numbers. It gets better with each day and more, more accurate. But um, we still see that our peak is going to be, um, we're thinking, in a couple of weeks. Um, we're seeing it more toward mid, late April. Um, depending on how successful we are with our staying at home, with the, the social distancing, that might push that out a little further. But we know and we already see from the stories from the front line, it's, it's a lot of work right now in ICUs and hospitals. They're really already seeing this. We're certainly seeing a lot um, in our front line workers, especially in nursing homes. Uh, next slide. We're also tracking as best we can because there's not great accurate data out there and I'll share this with the media and we'll keep sharing with you what we have as we have it. But this is graph which will be on our website. It's talking about different levels of PPE, masks and, and what our hospitals have right now. And as best as we can tell, we have the amounts of currently available. And when you look at the yellow, that's where there's already critical shortages. And this is just going up to their typical 100% occupancy. What the general and I are working on with all our hospital CEOs is basically doubling that capacity again, at least doubling what they already do. And with that, they need all the increased equipment, all the increased staff, and of course, the locations. Um, so that's a little bit of a, a, a map of where we are currently. Next slide. Similarly, looking at this line up here is our current capacity. We know we need to double that. 
We don't have exact numbers because, again, we can't put exact case numbers in yet. But we know right now, currently, we, the hospitals have done a great job of freeing up the equipment by not doing elective surgeries. Right now, it shows you that, for instance, we're at 54% occupancy across, it varies by hospital, on our med surge beds that are in current use. 30% of our ventilators currently are in use. Now, we need to free up all the way up to 100% and then go up to 200% is our goal. Next slide. So I'd like to talk a little bit more for a moment about what, what we're working on. I know um, we've talked a little bit about regional plans. And I think that sounds like a very concrete thing, like there's this one blueprint for how our hospitals are acting. In truth, no hospital system in this world has ever faced what we're facing around the world with coronavirus. And so when we say plans, what we're really doing is ongoing, ever-evolving planning. And that isn't a static one answer or one fits all. It will actually continue. Our planning will go through the surge and it will continue after the surge and will continue after we start to return back to normal life. We are never going to work together quite the same, to be honest. And we're learning a lot as we go through this. First of all, typically hospitals, you know, I'll use Columbus as an example because it's where I live right now here in Columbus. You know, we have several hospital systems. We have things like the Ohio State. We have a VA hospital. We have nursing homes. We have long-term and residential psychiatric facilities. All of these work, and they try to collaborate across those systems, but they're collaborating just in one city. They also have branches of their hospital that have much larger containment areas that go out into many cities. And throughout Ohio, we have these systems, and there are local, small hospitals in rural areas and suburban areas. They all connect uh, to each other, but now they're having to connect each other in, in different ways than they ever have. And what I'm so proud of is the CEOs of all these hospitals are working together to create a master system. Um, that's what I'm spending my time working on. How do we work together as one state? We're no longer saying you're my patient or you're their patient. How are we going to maximize our resources? What are we going to build out at the local level and in the bigger urban centers, whether it's having some centers for more mildly ill folks that might be a build out of something like a convention center, like an IX or Duke. Maybe we're using nursing home beds in slightly different ways. Maybe we're using hospital and hotel rooms differently. Maybe we're using dorms. All of that is in progress. There is not one final answer, but that is what we're working on 24 seven is sort of how we maximize these. And we're working closely with our civic leaders. We're working closely with our nonprofits. So when we say, and when the governor assigned us a plan and a deadline, I think that might have sounded like there is like this finishing line. And in fact, there isn't. In fact, we're building, 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 and evolving. And we'll share with you as we do that more and more detail as that emerges. Um, but that's to say, back at the EOC, our job in government is to help these hospitals as best we can, remove barriers that are in their way. Perhaps there's issues around licensing and getting some of our nursing and med students out there. We'll help with that. We're there at the control center, working closely with those of you on the ground to get you the resources you need as we have them. So that is part of an ongoing, really one system, one health approach in Ohio. And we're also working with our neighboring states, governors, and their hospitals. So we have people that live in Ohio, uh, but maybe work across the border in Michigan or Kentucky. And all of that has to talk to each other. And that's, that's the system we're building. One last thing. Someone has told me that it is Doctor's Day, which, of course, I didn't know, Governor, that there is such a thing. Um, I had the opportunity um, watch, to watch this press conference yesterday um, from the EOC. Um, and it got me thinking, and my husband shares a little bit of what he's seeing out there. I have the honor of wearing 
this white coat, which I know has become a little bit iconic. But it became very clear to me that I'm, I'm wearing a symbol of all my friends and colleagues and your family members who are out on the front lines. I'm thinking about you a lot, um, more than I can express, because I've spent many years on the front lines and sometimes feel frustrated that I can't just come in there and work alongside of you in doing this bigger picture planning. Um, but this white coat represents all of you. It's Doctor's Day. We're losing people. In these deaths, they're starting to be personal. I know we lost an ER nurse. I just learned this news yesterday who was working, again, a younger person who has a family, um, working alongside her colleagues, and her colleagues had to help her when she got sick. I know we lost um, someone from one of our health boards, one of the boards of health members. And all of this is personal. It's becoming increasingly personal to all of us. And so I just want to let you know that I'm wearing this coat, and I'm thinking you every day I put it on. So thank you. Dr. Atkin, thank you very much. We'll be happy to respond to questions. Hey, this is Molly Martinez with Spectrum News. I have a question for um, the Lieutenant Governor. Uh, now that this Patel deal is a go, can you sort of expound on what this means for jobs, what this means for Patel, uh, what this means for Ohio, and what this sort of means for the workflow of getting these masks sanitized? Well, I appreciate the question. The, the people that it matters most to are the people who work in our healthcare institutions, our hospitals, because they were running low on the protective equipment that they need. And so every day, uh, they're going to be able to send that off to Battelle. Uh, and Battelle will go through the process of decontaminating that and then sending that same equipment back to the same uh, medical institution. So that's what they're going to do. At last, uh, you know, when I talked to Louvon there late last night from Battelle, they will be ramping this up as fast as they can. I know that they expect to do uh, 10,000 uh, tomorrow, and then every day that they can get the shipments in from the hospitals, and then they will process those as fast as they can. How the machines work, that there are four chambers in each machine. They can run um, at least 10,000 in each chamber, and there are four chambers in each machine, So, and they can run that for two shifts, so each machine under two shifts, should be able to uh, ultimately decontaminate 80,000 of those uh, uh, N93 or N95 masks, and then uh, they have two of those. So once they get those fully up and running, they should be able to do 160,000, but that's not gonna happen immediately. They're going to ramp up to that. There's a supply chain of both getting those from the hospital and the logistics of getting them there and then getting them back, but, but Starting basically today, they are gearing it up and they will start uh, 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 delivering, I think, as early as tomorrow. And then do you know why there was a, a lag getting this green lit by the FDA? You know, <laughs> they, I think the FDA thought they were doing what Battelle was asking. I think there was, you know, at, we'll just take everybody, you know, as they explained it, FDA thought they were doing what that was right. Battelle had asked for something differently. Uh, once the governor really brought his, his personal uh, influence into that discussion and then got President Trump involved, it, it got everybody together so that what might have taken days happened in hours. And so we're very, very uh, much benefited by everybody pulling together from the governor to the president to our team to the FDA team. In the end, it got done yesterday, and so there will be no holdup in the process for Patel getting its work done. Thank you. Jim Otte from WHIO-TV in Dayton. Thank you, Governor. I have a question for you. I want to get to the thought process of balancing safety for kids in the classroom and then all the logistical hassles of starting back up when you give them the green light. Could you talk for a minute about your considerations here at some point, you have to decide if we're going to have a school year at all. When do you have to make that decision? And is there a possibility this school year could go into the summer? Is that possible? Well, Jim, the way we're proceeding uh, is school really continues 
um, it's not continuing in the classroom and the physical building, but is continuing. And one of the you know, heartening things that I see uh, when I talk to Paulo uh, and talk to teachers and superintendents uh, is the great job that teachers are doing, the great job that families are doing to continue this education under uh, obviously a difficult uh, circumstance. So they're continuing to do that. Um, we want to take this kind of one chunk at a time because we don't know exactly where we're going to be. Uh, but it's clear that we're not going to be back in the classroom before May 1. And so we want to signal to everybody today, you can plan, you need to continue on the education un until, until May 1. Is it possible that that will have to continue the way it is now remotely uh, until the end of the school year? Yes, it is. That's certainly possible. We just don't know yet until we see exactly where, where we are. Uh, the initial decision was made for the safety of students, but also, frankly, for the safety of every Ohioan. Um, we have seen young people get sick, and we have seen young people come down with this. Uh, obviously, when you put a lot of kids in, in, in just in one classroom, uh, you've got many, many families represented. So if one, one brings in the, the virus, then that could go out to every kid in that classroom, and then that goes back to all those families. So uh, kids are obviously, just like everyone else, can be a, can be a carrier. So that was the, you know, the, the big concern that, that we have, and, and just it made no sense if we were going to try to slow this down uh, to continue to have kids congregating in school every, every single day. So that's why we made the decision. As Governor, far, could, you, could you extend the the school year if we go back to the classroom into June or July? Well, I th I th you, you could do that. Um, I don't know that that's what we would do. Uh, I think it's more likely uh, that we would try to get by through this school year uh, with the remote learning. Uh, now, let me just kind of be candid. Uh, I, I've had some superintendents that we've talked to who are concerned, uh, and they're concerned that their particular students uh, are going to be further behind. And the reason is that not every school has the same ability to do distance learning. Uh, not every school uh, has the ability to do that. So you'll have, in some cases, uh, families in, in cities, for example, who, who may not have the ability to, to do that. And we'll also have in the rural areas, we may have families uh, that can't access that. And maybe a whole community cannot really access the, the internet. So, these are things that we're going to have to try to figure out as we move forward. How do we compensate uh, these kids uh, for that? How do we give them that extra help that, that we need? Now, the other factor is we do have money coming in from the federal government, and some of this money has been designated for the schools. And so we're still trying to figure out exactly how that is going to work. Some of that will go through the state. Some of that will go directly to the school. So these are all the things that we're, we're weighing. Uh, we're very open to hear from teachers and from superintendents. Uh, that communication has been good. We encourage that uh, as we look forward and have to make the difficult decisions and decisions that, frankly, we, none of us thought we were going to have to be making this year. If I could add a little, a little helpful tool for, for um, some of the families, They're, the internet service providers, many of them are putting hotspots out there where people can come and download and upload uh, content into the computers for their, uh, their children if they don't have good internet service uh, uh, at, their, at their home or their place of residence. We are trying to compile a list for, uh, for everyone so that they know where those are in their own communities. Jim Province with the Toledo Blade, a question for Dr. Atkin. There's been a lot of discussion about building out the physical infrastructure of our healthcare system. Could you talk about the people infrastructure of that system? Where do we stand in terms of manpower and what are we doing to bring in more nurses, more doctors? Thank you so much, that's a great point. When we talk about capacity, some of it is physical, but it is all the doctors and the nurses and the folks that wrap around that. And then it's also the equipment that they need to do the job. So there are many components to upping our ability to treat someone. And so we have a whole team that's working on this staffing workforce issue. And there's a couple different avenues in it. Um, some of it, um, when I talk to you more in the days to come about how we're sort of creating these zones in our state, 
Um, we're, we're doing that around the big city. So it's Cleveland is going to be sort of a, a one area across the northern part of our state. There's the middle area and, and, and more southern. And in some places, in one zone, they've tried some things. Like in one zone, they're already doing um, online trainings to help take nursing students or nurses who have been doing other kinds of work or patient care assistants and training them for a new job or training a surgeon how they might become able to do some nursing things. So some of those innovations that one area of our state has already discovered, one of the things I'm doing is trying to universalize that or share the best practices that one place is using or anywhere in this country. So we have a group of people that are feeding that into those healthcare systems. Then we're also looking at things like what our state medical board can do, whether we need to make any waivers, um, we're also um, graduating classes early. So there's in some areas of the state, I've heard that the deans who are now all talking collectively, that's my job is get them all talk and then go out and take their innovation to each other. Um, they're looking at graduating classes early so those folks can be deployed on the front lines. So there's a lot of moving pieces to the people problem. And it's not just for our hospitals. We are actually working with earlier year med students and nursing students. Um, to get them to be amateur disease detectives, we're actually building a curriculum for them to be trained in, because we know part of the way of getting out of this is going to have five components, which I'd be glad to talk about as well. We know that to get out of this, we're going to have to have a bunch of things in place. And one of them, once we have that testing, where we can be testing much more of the population, we're actually going to have to go back to the basics that we did in the beginning, which is extensive identification of somebody who's infected and contact tracing. And we're going to actually need literally boots on the ground folks, far beyond anything public health has even had on their payrolls, to be able to do that and do that as quickly as possible. So we're designing a new workforce that's never existed. And it'll be a wonderful learning opportunity for all of those I mean, the people who are training in healthcare today, uh, they're gonna, this is going to be a memory, a turning point in their careers. So, so all of that is underway. Um, and I'll tell you more and more of sort of those innovations as they occur, because it's, everything is moving. When you talk about graduating classes early, are there actually medical students that are now in these hospitals? Yeah, medical students typically, um, you do some first year of classes, but then you spend a lot of your medical training in hospitals. So they've been through rotations where they learn this. And the question is, if you were going to graduate in June or May, usually it's often May. As a matter of fact, I was scheduled to speak at the commencement of Neomed where I graduated. Um, you know, those folks, there's nothing that really keeps them from not being able to go out and do that work now. Thank you. A question for Governor DeWine, uh, John Kosick from News 5 in Cleveland. You've acted boldly and swiftly throughout this process to position us to be where we are in this state. The decision today with the school is an example of that. But when you look at neighboring states with hot spots that are popping up, like Detroit and Michigan, are there other things that you are considering right now, other steps related to travel? Well, that's a very good question. Um, you know, I have been in the last... Uh, 100 hours or so in contact with every governor in every state around us. We've been, we talked, we've been on the phone. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of what's going on to some extent in, in Detroit. Uh, I had the opportunity to talk this morning uh, to the mayor of Toledo, uh, who did express concern about that. Uh, the way we left that conversation was we need to get more specifics about what's, what, is, what is going on there, because frankly, we're going to need some of their hospitals too. Uh, and so there's a flow the other way as, as well. So it, it is of a concern. Uh, we're looking at it. And Governor, I might add, um, my, I was on the phone just last night with all the health directors that are my position in these neighboring states as well. So we're really talking a lot. Our healthcare systems don't stop at the border. As I said before, people live on one side, work on the other. You might go to a hospital across that. So, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of is we're being very communicative and, and talking across those lines. I do think that one thing we can take into account is if you've been somewhere, first of all, all of us should sort of be assuming, once again, that we all 
potentially have this, we might be asymptomatic. And certainly, if you've traveled recently to a place that is one of those more hot spots, you should almost be imagining that you are coming back from China. You really should stay at home, quarantine yourself voluntarily for 14 days. If you've been in an area where there's just a huge, huge amount of activity, the problem right now is that's starting to be just about everywhere. And it's starting to be, even in places that we can't point at it, it's because we can't test and say it's there. We know the spread's there. So I think we all, part of this whole isolation of, that we're doing of ourselves, the quarantining, it is with that in mind. Thank you. Hi, Jesse Balmert with the Cincinnati Inquirer for either the governor or Dr. Acton. You had asked the local hospital systems or regions to come up with a plan for building up capacity. So I guess first, did you receive plans from all eight regions? And then what were you able to learn about hospitals' capacity and their ability to build that up in the coming weeks? Yeah, I think I'll let Dr. Acton uh, answer that because she's been immersed in that and remains okay. immersed in it. All right. Dr. Acton? So, much, much as what I was saying in the earlier answer to the question was, there have been plans all along in the sense that hospitals, schools, health departments, and communities through regional planning networks do preparedness activities. And those plans vary from, you know, at this stage you get all your key stakeholders together, but it might not say exactly who those stakeholders are because each crisis involves a different answer to that question. So when we talk about that planning that's already existed, that means that you have identified all the people you work with and sort of the processes you go through. But those answers specific to this unique public health crisis, this unprecedented crisis, those never existed. And we didn't have a coronavirus COVID-19 plan. And so what we really asked for was share with us all your thoughts and what you're thinking. It wasn't just something they sent to us, although some had various levels of like, here's who we have on our team. But it, we actually have a team of people who have sat down and gone through a really in-depth interview of those folks because the answers are a little different by community. And they're compiling all that and sort of taking that in and they're collating that up into this larger systems approach. And that work will not stop. I mean, there won't be a, a point, maybe afterwards when it's all done, there'll be a publish, like how it worked. But it will never stop because quite honestly, we're burning daylight here as the governor always says. You know, we're building this every second of every day. And some of those plans include things like, this hospital is going to now become the designated real high intensity hospital. And they might actually refer more to their low intensity routine things to the neighboring hospital. But that varies in different parts of the state. And it, it has to do with communications. Like we have almost like an air traffic control process in place that already exists in healthcare when, when we have um, level one ICUs. And when you have a trauma, which hospital does it go to next? Where does med flight fly the patient to? So we're taking those existing we're opening more gates at the airport, we're doing our air traffic control, but we are actually building a more specific air traffic control tower back at the EOC that watches this alongside the regions. And then they're opening up more gates at the airport for more traffic. And that is the level of planning we're doing. So we're building out the exact way we're gonna communicate. And then if we see in one area, that all of a sudden, because we know this will surge, not all at once, it'll surge in different communities at different times. Oh, from the ground um, with General Harris's folks, we're short of this PPE and we've just received a shipment. Our job will be to get that out to the right place at the right time. So it's the logistics of that. So that's the process that's going on in a nutshell. Um, it's being invented specifically for this situation. And I want to add just real quickly, the, those plans that go on like that, um, they are across state borders. So Kentucky has already been talking to Cincinnati as part of routine business. So it's really helpful because we already have those relationships. Thank you. Hello, Kevin Landers, Channel 10. Uh, this morning, uh, ODH sent out a tweet at 10 o'clock saying, 
Ohio State's parks are open and enjoy the springtime weather by getting outdoors. We've had multiple people who've emailed our station saying that there are people who are flooding outdoor parks and they're not practicing social distancing. And I'm wondering if your order wasn't strict enough regarding this kind of activity and it seems to be some mixed messages. Can you address that please? Well, we continue to uh, review the order. Uh, in fact, <clears throat> we're in the process of doing that Right now, we will have a new order in the, in the next several days. Uh, so what goes in, into that order, we're still thinking about. Uh, the concern is the same, that we have to slow this virus down. Uh, the only way we slow it down is if people separate. Uh, it is certainly, um, if you looked at the weather yesterday, um, it was a great day to be out. My wife and I walked on our farm in the morning, and we walked in the, in the evening. Um, so it was a great day to be out. Uh, but, and, and frankly, our state parks are pretty big. Uh, so if people want to walk in the state parks, they, they have ample opportunity to have all that social distancing. Um, what we get reports on, and I've talked to some of the mayors, I've talked to some of the chiefs of police, uh, is that as the weather gets better, any day the weather is better, you are seeing people congregate. Uh, and you're seeing them sometimes congregate in metro parks, you're, seeing them uh, congregate in, in, in different places. So it, it is a concern, particularly as the weather gets better, um, about that social distancing. Again, it, we're, we're looking at this. Uh, we've issued a lot of orders, more orders than we ever wanted to issue. Uh, the question is, do we have to issue any more? Uh, but certainly, uh, and we're looking at that, but certainly it, it goes back to what we've been saying, that ultimately, how well we do is going to be determined by each individual in Ohio and how well they stay away from others. And, and going out, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about basketball earlier on. And, and frankly, some of the mayors have taken the, the action of just removing, removing uh, uh, you know, the rims, the backboards. And uh, so it's, it's, this is a work in progress, really. As a follow-up to, uh, for Dr. Acton, um, as more people get sick, um, there are fewer healthier people that would be infected. So when you look at Cuyahoga County, which leads the state with uh, the most cases and most hospitalizations, I'm wondering at what point do you ever consider a perimeter to uh, slow the exponential spread? You know, Kevin, the biggest problem we have is we just don't know for sure who has been infected, who is already infected and maybe has, maybe didn't even notice they were infected or thought they had something else earlier. And we just don't have the data yet on who's getting better and how quickly. So even in Cuyahoga, when we look at Cuyahoga, they're drawing from a lot of areas. They've had a little bit more testing than say, a hospital in Southeast Ohio has had. So any information that would allow that sort of geography to be clear, is we just don't have that yet. I can't say that there wouldn't be that someday on the other side of this in the future, but it's just just too soon to know that sort of information. Could I, could I add um, something to the first part of your question, Kevin? You know, every day we have an opportunity to be part of the solution or part of the problem. I, I say this over and over again. Uh, the governor and the director have issued orders and advisories and everything. And I imagine this is kind of like the 70-30 situation where 70% where of the population is listening and following the, the, the orders. And there's probably a 30% that's not doing that. And I imagine everybody who's watching every day is part of the 70% uh, that you understand it's up to all of us in our daily lives to help communicate that to people who maybe aren't getting the message, to politely say to them, you know, you know I'm stepping back, I'm not going to violate these rules. It's, 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 it's being helpful, not rude, to somebody to help them understand how we're all in this together. And it's gonna take every one of us. You, you can't make people comply by writing rules. You have to rely on, on their sense of civic responsibility to do this, partnered up with the enforcement actions that also exist in those rules. So again, it's, it is the truth. We're all in it together. Every one of us can play a part in helping coach people along so that we get through this more swiftly and more healthily. 
Hi, uh, Andrew Welsh Huggins with the Associated Press. Uh, Governor, as you probably know, uh, an inmate has sued um, in the Ohio Supreme Court um, asking to be released as a result of his concerns about the overcrowded conditions in his cell. Basically, he's, he's at fear of um, uh, contracting the coronavirus. And in fact, has even gone so far as to say he'll go back to prison once it's over if he's released. Um, regardless of whether you can talk about his specific lawsuit, can you bring us up to date on what the situation is in the prisons. We do know one employee has tested positive. And what are your concerns and strategies for uh, limiting the spread inside the prisons and the jails for that matter? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, we think about this every day. We work on this every day. Uh, our concern, of course, is to keep our prison staff safe and the prisoners safe. Uh, I can tell you from uh, having involvement with prisons going back to when I was George Voinovich's lieutenant governor, that people who work in the prisons, um, they're unique. Uh, and they're unique. They, they are in there every day. Uh, it takes a special person to do it. And their goal is to keep the prisoner safe. And their goal is for them to be safe. So that is our goal. Um, Director Annette Chambers-Smith uh, reports to me often on this. Uh, she and I talked several times today about it. Uh, she not only is a very experienced uh, person working in our prisons for many, many years, uh, but she also, uh, her area that she's worked in before she became director, included uh, a lot of work in the area of the health within the prison and the medical, how you deal with the medical situation in the prison. Uh, so they instituted some time ago uh, a, a practice of checking on every uh, employee who comes in. Uh, and they follow, they follow a, a, a pretty rigorous uh, protocol. And I, asked, I asked, asked the director to kind of give me a summary. Let me just read a little bit of it to you, if I could. Um, every member of the department has been encouraged to stay home if they're ill. They've all been made aware of the symptoms of COVID-19 to make sure they do not come to work if ill. We started screening all department staff on March 11th. Before entering the prison, staff are screened using a questionnaire developed using ODH and CDC guidelines. That screening form requires a temperature to be taken, takes into account travel to countries with a travel advisory as noted by the CDC. Direct contact takes into consideration direct contact with a person known to be infected with COVID-19 and also any symptoms such as fever, chills, cough, and difficulty breathing. Um, and she goes on to talk about this particular, we have, as, as you noted, uh, we have one member of the staff who has in fact tested uh, positive. Uh, on Sunday, uh, the director continues, we were notified about 3 p.m. that a staff member tested positive for COVID-19. As soon as we knew we had a positive staff member, we implemented an ODH approved risk assessment form that takes into account exposure or contact with the staff member who is positive as well as any symptoms the individual is experiencing when the risk assessment is done. Uh, so they're now going through the, the, the process of, as, as we always should, is looking to see who that uh, staff person has had contact with. Uh, several people have, have been actually sent home. Um, at, at this point, she goes on, uh, five staff members had no symptoms, but were told to self-quarantine for 14 days. Uh, four staff had symptoms. They were, they, they were also uh, told to quarantine, uh, and they were to go to their physician um, and, and go with guidance from the physician. Uh, we've also asked, I've also asked for those individuals to be tested, uh, and that is going to, that is going to take place. Uh, so these are all things that um, the prison is doing. Uh, we're implementing the same thing, uh, or not implementing, we have in place the same thing at the Department of Youth Services for our younger uh, uh, people, juveniles who, who are in state custody. Uh, we've also implemented similar uh, protocols in our psychiatric hospitals and anything basically that the state is running, um, we, are, we are following this. Uh, is it a concern? Absolutely. Uh, it's absolutely a concern whenever you have 
uh, you know, significant number of people who are together, uh, in whatever the circumstances, that is, that is a concern. And the director is, I think, doing a very good job. Her team's doing a good job. But it's always, uh, it's always a work in progress. Thank you, Governor. Quick unrelated question. Do we know where the ER, ER nurse is from that uh, the doctor mentioned? Uh, do we know what? I'm sorry. The ER nurse who passed that Dr. Acton mentioned. Do we know where she's, he or she is from? Um, I, I can't um, give that information. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your answers. Thank you. Ben Garbrick with ABC6 and Fox 20 in Columbus. My question is for Lieutenant Governor Husted about unemployment benefits. Last week you told us about some uh, work being done to increase the capacity of the website, extend some of the hours where people might be able to call and talk with someone on the phone. Can you give us an update on where that work stands? Because we're still receiving a lot of complaints from people who are trying to file for unemployment but are either having problems with the website or they call during some of those extended hours and they're getting an automated message that the office is in fact closed. Yeah, first of all, let me address the, the call piece of this. Um, the, the call center is open from 7 a.m. to 7, 7 p.m. We've added 100 people to the call center uh, to be able to address those calls. It's open from 9 to 1 on Saturdays. So that, that's where we are with the call center. They've expanded capacity uh, on, on the website. Uh, there has been an increase of capacity with added servers of 20 times uh, what the website was designed to handle. Uh, and uh, they have, uh, on the end that we are in control of, that has largely it's, well, it's been slow, it's, it's not gone down, it's been functional all the way through. Uh, there are two phases to getting in. A lot of times, you know, I, mean, I know that when we've been doing calls, uh, conference calls and things like that, sometimes we have even trouble getting into conference calls and getting on the internet and downloading things just because of the volume of things that are coming through from, from our own homes or our own place of work. And so we, that, is a, that is part of the, uh, the challenge that we have. We are adding the capacity on the website end, but also a word of advice, if you're sitting there and you clicked on and you see the, 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 the circling uh, uh, wheel figure, the wheel, that, the wheel is, that is, uh, shows that it's processing, don't keep clicking because what that does is it sends you back to the end of the line again. So just be patient, it will get through. Um, but one thing that everybody should know that even if you get delayed in this, that your eligibility will be backdated to the time that you're eligible uh, and, and you will receive all of the benefits that you are eligible to receive no matter when you file. So, so it, is, it is moving along. That's the capacity that's been added. I talked to the director just before I came in here. Uh, she said that it was running fine, although there are moments that it's slow. Remember, this runs 24 hours a day, so at peak times it's gonna be slower than if you do it at non-peak times. And so that's just a word of, a word of counsel on how you can, you can best get in. Uh, we also know that there are new, going to be new groups of people, 1099 independently employed folks who are eligible for, under, for new benefits under the CARE Act. That is an entirely new separate system that's going to have to be set up. It, this will happen in weeks, not days. It's going to take, uh, no state has a, a off the shelf solution that they have. We're working with the private sector to bring the best tech people we can to the solution of, of standing that new service up as soon as we can. Thank you. Hi, this is Andrew Tobias at cleveland.com, and I think this question is for Director Acton, although maybe it could be for the governor too. Uh, we saw a study out of the University of Washington that came out today, and essentially is much less dire than the projections that the Divine Administration has been citing, among other things. They expect the cases to peak in April 19, 3,900 hospital beds, and so on. So it's much less dire than what you guys have seen. And we're just wondering what you think of that, if you lend any credence to it, and generally how you weigh different projections when you're uh, forming your response. Well, Dr. Acton and I have been talking about that, <clears throat> that study, and I just asked her, <clears throat> excuse me, to kind of yeah. fill everybody else in on what you told me. So. So that study um, is some modeling that's being done at the Institute for Health Metrics in Washington State, which is one of my favorite places to go for global metrics. So just give that asterisk. Um, 
But I've had my team take a look at that, and they even say in their um, information that they, they want the states to reach out to them to give them more elaborate data as they have it because their models are sort of projecting for everyone and don't have a lot of the same nuances of the local. Um, I've, I've not talked to my team yet to understand more about it, but my understanding is that something in the modeling is looking sort of at what a peak capacity on a day will be. But what I, I explained before in the details of this modeling is we know at our peak whether we know that we're going to have anywhere from a range of six to 8,000 on the most dire projections I've seen so far have been 10,000 cases per day. Remember that only about 20% or so of those cases, um, ours are higher right now because our testing is of sicker people, will end up in the hospital. And then a percentage of that group will end up in the ICU. But the average length of stay typically in a hospital is three days. The average length of stay for any of these cases is up to 20 days. So there's a period of time that they're admitted to the hospital and then they go to the ICU. So you can't just look at who might be sick or the number of cases in a day if they're piling on top of each other logarithmically. So those beds aren't emptying out. And that's all part of the complicated calculations that I think some of our modelers are trying to take into account. So um, I'll let the modelers themselves kind of talk through that. I know some of them have been doing videos back and forth with each other. They're all colleagues, and they're all talking through those numbers. Yeah, and Andrew, um, in support of what Dr. Acton just said, uh, we, we have a great group of people who are volunteering to you know, check everybody's homework on this. And, and one of the people that I reached out to, because I saw that story before we walked in here and I talked with Dr. Acton about it, uh, that maybe give you a tip as to how you can view this or look into it and talk to other modelers uh, on the validity and, and the comparison of these is that it is that I was logical model in looking at this issue. So it's a different lens to view it. Doesn't doesn't make it right or doesn't make it wrong. It's just one of the data points that we add in to how we look at all of this. Uh, Noah Belinda with Hannah News Service. I'm wondering um, your projections of what the uh, Department of Rehabilitation and Correction workshops will be able to put out in terms of PPE and sanitizer. Does that assume kind of a healthy prison population, or are you assuming some percentage of people and oh, that would guards assume, being offline? Look, look, that would assume a healthy prison population, and we are, you know. We asked DRC, uh, the prisons, to see what they could do. Um, these numbers will help. Um, we're all in this together. We're trying to get everybody on board to do different things, and these are the things that uh, they felt that they could do. That was the last question. Okay, I guess that, that, that is it. In conclusion, uh, a couple things. I want to wish my uh, grandson, uh, Brian, a happy birthday. Brian, happy birthday. is great. Our daughter-in-law, uh, Becca, uh, as well. Becca, happy, happy birthday. This is, as you can see, this is a big uh, birthday day in the DeWine family. Uh, our, ne our nephew, Ben, uh, birthday is also today. And, and our uh, niece, Rachel had her birthday this weekend. So happy birthday to, to all four of you and to everybody else who's having a birthday uh, today. We um, observe a National Doctors Appreciation Day today. And um, as Dr. Acton said, she's sort of representing not only the doctors, but everybody in the health care community. Uh, so we thank you for what you do each and every day. Uh, we thank you for the sacrifice that you make. Uh, you all are at the front lines, and we are very, very grateful uh, for everything that you do. Uh, we do have a, a little uh, video which we would like to roll, and if we could do that. Eric, thank you very much. I want you and all of you at home to don your cape. Don that cape. Keep being a force for good. Hi, my name is Amy Acton. Any questions? the great work.
figure this out and not be scared. We are a little nervous, but we're not going to be scared. I am not afraid. I am determined. I want to be like you don't get any. So to all our heroes out there, thank you very much. We'll see you all tomorrow. <laughs> we now join our regularly scheduled program already in progress. This, this horrible virus. And so, yes, just celebrate being a controller and being in control of your environment, of your health the health of your husband, Pearson. So celebrate being a controller and stand firm on that because that's what I'm doing. I really believe in isolation in this quarantine and all of the rules. And Pearson, you may believe that you cannot trust all of the news, but everything they're all saying though is for our health and for our safety. So celebrate the control factor in your personality. And then also, Everything that you said, I, I kept thinking of a quote that I have say a lot of the times. If you really love me, don't entertain my enemies. And the way I relate to that here is you see this virus and you see the other people he's going up to, he's entertaining when he goes out to visit your enemies. And Pearson, if you could just think of it that way, that every time you just forget about her feelings when you allow someone in your home or you go to someone else's home or you even interact with anyone, you're bringing her concerns and her worries back to her without even thinking of her. That's the way I'm feeling for you, Pepper. Not, I just hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, that's awesome. That's an awesome perspective. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. That helped. That helps me too, Rob. Thank you. Uh, and all of us, the four of us here, are in the age group that is higher risk so if, if something does happen. The risk reward ratio is just not worth it. The, the ratio just doesn't work out. And, you know, it's, it, it really gets down to acknowledging this the situation very specifically where the two of you can sit down and say, look, we don't have to think exactly the same way. But we do need to acknowledge that we both want the same thing. We both want to come through this as healthy.